Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. What is up, guys? Here it is, your boy Kagi, back at it again with a new video. And in this video, I bring you the founder and CEO of Sparkedia.gg. This is a AAA game on the blockchain. And I'm very excited to bring you this founder because I found this game and I was like, what the hell? How do I not know about this game? So, Chandler, welcome to the channel. I appreciate you giving me your time and I appreciate you building this game that we need a lot in the blockchain right now <laughs> we no no I, I appreciate you guys finding us honestly uh i told kagi this already and i said you you were our first piece of organic content of somebody learning about us and making a video um and so seeing that really warmed my heart uh not only that but then as soon as i had the follow-up call with you guys it was instant i just like no these guys are uh these guys actually care um which is super super important to us so uh, no it's it's an honor to be here and it, it's it's been a pleasure working with you guys so far well, glad to have you, my friend. Thank you for those words. Look, let's start with who you are. Yeah. Tell me about yourself. Tell me where you come from. How did this become a thing, Sparkedia? Because there's always a story behind, behind yeah. the scenes. Right? No, our story is pretty interesting, honestly. Um, and I'm, I, I tell the story every time, I think, in every AMA. And I think, it's, you know, people that listen to our interviews or AMAs often are probably like, oh, my God, this story again. But honestly, um, Eden Brawl started about six years ago. And I had just always, always, always wanted to make games. I kind of knew from like 12 years old, I was like, you know, playing games. Diablo 2 was my favorite game when I was 12. And I was like, man, I could do this better. Like, why didn't they make these decisions? I just knew that I was going to make games at some point. Uh, got really, really into World of Warcraft, started a business buying and selling World of Warcraft accounts. And I was like, okay, now, now gaming is a business for me. I, I can totally do this. Um, went to school, took my first programming class and said, yep, never mind. <laughs> turns out that's not what I want to do with my career. Um, it turns out I just don't like programming. Uh, but knew that I wanted to make games. So I ended up getting a job as a consultant. I uh, did a bunch of IT work basically for 12 years. But over the course of that time, you know, had too much time and money on my hands and the, the game bug kept, kept biting. And I said, okay, it's time to actually pull the trigger on this. How, how hard can making a game be? And tried it and it turns out it was really hard. So I thought I'd spend about a year and year of my life, year, year and a half. We'd get to Kickstarter. I'd spend like, you know, 20, 25 grand, which I could swallow at the time. I, I could live with that. Uh, and it ended up taking six years and about 250 grand, which I could not swallow at the time, uh, but eventually just built up uh, over time. And we built this really cool game. And honestly, we had a few members of the community that were just like really encouraging to keeping us going. And we kept going and going and going. And eventually we finally raised money for it. And now it's a full time job uh, and it's the most amazing feeling in the world. I'm glad I'm glad you you know you found your way to this point because you know that is one of the hardest things you know not not giving up sometimes yeah. you have to give up projects that's the crazy part yeah. right you have to you have to know when to give up and <laughs> it's it's a hard thing to it's a hard thing to to swallow too like okay this one I have to let it go yeah I mean I think you know if if you would have asked me like three years in or four years in uh, you know I'd be at parties or you know hanging out with friends like yo Chandler how's how's your game doing by the way and I'm like yeah you know I don't. I don't really feel like talking about it right now. Like it's, yeah. it felt like a sunk cost. It's like, I'd, I'd love to give up, but I've spent too much time money on it now. But I really credit the community. Like there's just a few people that were just like showing up every single weekend. Like, hey, this is, this has got something here. Um, and that kept me going for sure. Hey, shout out to the community. If you're watching this, for much sure. love for pushing this guy forward, you know? All right, so let's get into what is Sparkedia and what is Edinburgh? Because obviously Sparkedia <laughs> is kind of like the parent company that will have a lot of games, a lot of features, and then, Edinburgh is one of the games under Sparkedia. So yeah. Can you explain both of those real quick? Um, yeah, you, you, you had a pretty good summary there. And honestly, this is a marketing problem we're still trying to solve. We haven't quite figured out how to properly communicate it. Um, so Sparkedia is what we call the ecosystem. Um, and it's an ecosystem of connected games. If you think about like a hub and spoke, like a tire, you have this centerpiece of the hub. That is Sparkadia. And then each spoke, each piece around it is an individual game. And Eden Brawl is our first game that we're doing. Um, so, you know... For Sparkadia, the, the main draw is Eden Brawl, and the main draw is games. So we talk a lot about, you know, the dreaded quote-unquote metaverse word. Um, and we are building a metaverse, essentially, but it, it's it's a metaverse that's driven by games. We call them, you know, an arcade lobby versus an arcade machine. Um, and we think a lot of people are out there building uh, metaverses without arcade machines. And it's like, hey, wh why would I want to come to this? Why would I want to come to this arcade lobby? You don't have any arcade machines. And so what we really wanted to do is build an, a, what we call a curated ecosystem of a bunch of games that are purposely connected together and purposely interoperable where it makes sense. And that where it makes sense is kind of like our mantra for the entire ecosystem of what's the point of interoperability if it doesn't make sense? Like, I don't want to force using other games and using other metaverses in my game if it doesn't make sense. 
And so what we're really trying to build is this place where, you know, in five years from now, you're going to log on with your friends into Sparkadia. You're going to walk around and you're going to be like, hey, what kind of game do you guys want to play? Do you want to play a MOBA? Do you want to play an RPG? Do you want to play a shooter, a card game? And you all do it from Sparkadia. And then there's only one Sparkadia token. So it's always working toward that same goal, working toward those same achievements. We want people to be Sparkadians, for, for lack of a better term. No, no, I understand it very well. It's a vertical, what I call, we call a vertical metaverse. There's there's horizontal metaverse where you kind of connect to many blockchains, Interesting. many games, right? Yeah. The, the vertical uh, metaverse is basically within your um, game, within your world, is where you want to connect everything within your world. You're basically a Nintendo, you're basically a Riot. You're, yeah. you, you, I get it. I, I, we, I understand it. I understand it. I, I like that people, a lot, yeah. People will understand this concept uh, over time. It's not that hard to understand. So let's talk about Eden Bro. Um, what is it that makes Eden Bro under Sparkadia, by the way, guys, under that world, what is it that makes this game so good compared <laughs> to other games on the blockchain, right? Because if we go to, uh, you know, Web 2 and we're honest, you know, it can compete in Web 2. Sure. But there's a lot of other good games out there. But in Web 3, this is like, this is one of the best ones out here. So what is it that makes it so cool, so, you know, what, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think, you know, fully transparent, like if, you know, if we were to go out and compete with League of Legends or Dota right now, like we're not, we're, we're not there yet. Um, it, it takes time and it takes, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to compete with those games. Um, but I do think our advantage over Web3 is the fact that I've been at this for six years. Um, I think people really discount how hard it is to make a super fun game. Like it takes a lot of time, a lot of community feedback, a lot of iteration. Um, there's some unlisted videos on our YouTube um, <laughs> that we've purposely taken down uh that if you look at the game three years ago you're like what in the world like i I'm can't believe this that, is yeah right? i can't believe this is the same game so it's it's really that iteration and the fact that we've been at this for so long we've had that time to figure things out i think people you know think oh you know oh wow web3 gaming is popping off i can take six months to a year and a lot of money and make it happen and to be honest i, I don't personally think you can it's very very difficult um, it takes time and it takes iteration. So I think that's really our advantage is we've gone through all of that. Um, and then chop it up, you know, as well as, you know, just the team behind it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I ran pretty much solo for the first six years, but I hired a bunch of freelancers. And the freelancers that I hired, I would go out and spend all day on ArtStation or, you know, some forums and be like, hey, I noticed you worked on this game. Will you come work for me for pennies on the dollar, <laughs> essentially, out yeah. of the goodness of your heart? And we hired really, really high quality people. And then as soon as we got the funding, we hired even higher quality people. Um, and I think that's really the ability. Yeah, to, tell to us a little up. bit about that and then tell us what is Edinburgh as a game. For the people that don't know, down to the core, what is this game? Yeah, uh, we call it a Mobrawler. Um, and the idea behind the Mobrawler is we look at MOBAs, League of Legends, Dota. We're obviously huge fans. I mean, we hired a bunch of Riot folks because we love League of Legends so much. Um, so there's obviously a ton of inspiration there. However, if everybody can think back to the very first game of League of Legends or Dota, even back in the Warcraft 3 days that, that you ever played, um, I specifically remember mine. It was not fun. Um, it's very slow. It's very overwhelming. I'm like, what do all these champions do? I don't understand how these objectives work. What is going on? And this was 12 years ago. Um, and the reason I kept playing is because all my friends played. Um, and they kind of talked me into it. And then, you know, you play 30, 40 games. And you're like, oh, okay. I see why this game is so fun. I really, really want to keep playing. And that's to us like the depth and the strategy of a MOBA game. But on the flip side, you have brawler games. And the main highlight we always like to call out here is Battle Right. Uh, absolutely incredible game. Came out about three, four years ago. Uh, never really reached a ton of popularity, but you know the people who loved it really loved it. And if you're not familiar, think, let's just talk about fighting games, Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter, for example. Um, these games are really, really easy at first. You can pick up and play. Uh, you can button mash and be successful essentially um, really easy to pick up and play, but they don't necessarily have that depth and that strategy of a MOBA. They're not as replayable and not as sustainable as a MOBA. And so we really wanted to build a game that combined both of these things and said game one, hey, I have no clue what's going on, but damn it, fighting isn't super fun. And then as you kind of play game four, game five, you start to figure out the ball. And I think we even saw it when you guys came in and played. You guys Literally, ran. Bro. It was like a 53-second sequence, I think it was, of you guys like running around like, no, pass the ball now, pass the ball now. And it yeah. starts to unlock. And that's really where, to us, the, the depth and the strategy goes. It's that, it's that third element between just you know running and fighting. You have to have mm -hmm. that kind of wild card. And I think that's really what the ball does. And I guess for people who don't know, we have a ball mode. And you grab the ball and you try to score the ball. And it's all about uh, executing that at the same time. I love that you said mode. Everybody. So that means you're going to have different modes. <laughs> <laughs> we think so. Yeah, we, we really think so. Um, you know, 
we we're still evaluating that we're doing a ton of stuff internally on like capture points and payloads and team death matches and, and i think the capture most the flag man that could be cool too. yeah so i think the most important thing for us yeah i like i like the, the innovation <laughs> there um i think the most important thing for us is that team death match feels fun mm -hmm. if just fighting each other can feel fun then you can start experimenting with the game mode we don't want a game that relies on the game mode itself we want a game that's like uh, overwatch always comes to mind it's like look i don't care if i'm pushing a payload i don't care if i'm capturing a point shooting people in overwatch is generally pretty fun mm -hmm. um and so that's really what we wanted to do and make a, a really fun combat loop and i think the ball is going to be you know kind of our flagship going forward um but i don't see any reason you know esports eventually that we do kind of like a, a gauntlet like hey you get to pick do you want to play in ball do you want to play capture do you want to play push and it's like best two out of three yeah, no, on, and on it makes it, it makes it way more dynamic i was still having a conversation with a friend I'll, I'll keep it short like which are the most competitive shooters out there right like and, and people say valorant call um uh counter strike, counter -Strike and, I, yeah. I, and i'm like they're competitive but if you really take halo and you really take call of duty they have multiple modes for a team to have synergy in all these modes and yeah. compete against another team that's the highest level of competitive that you can get you know capture the flag you know team deathmatch and then you got you know um oddball and all these game modes that have different styles you know uh king of the hill like yep. these are like very different style of game modes. I remember, yeah, I remember back in the day, um, God, man, I was so young. They had like the, I think it was on like G4 TV and they would have like these big esports competitions and it wasn't just one game. These players had to play like uh, Forza, Street Fighter, Halo, Quake, and like other stuff. And it was like, who could win all the games at once? Uh, and I always like thought that was really interesting. And, you know, I think you can make the argument like Valor and Counter-Strike are probably the most competitive games in the world. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but I think there's, you know, for other people who don't really want to dive into these super intricacies of like, you know, mouse perfect aiming and perfect executed strategies, I totally agree that I, I'm personally a fan of, hey, you know, there's different game modes and you're going to have to be good at all of them. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be adaptable. Um, and I think that's way more fun to me at least. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, it, there's also like, there's a different dynamic where like, you know, there's some game, there's some teams that might be really, really good at capture yeah. the flag or really good at King of the Hill. And then you now that's your nemesis, you know, like damn, like my favorite part about Counter-Strike is always like, oh, no, this so and so team is on this map. They're unbeatable. On this exactly, map. exactly. I think that's Same the most thing. interesting thing in the world. It's just yeah. like, you can't you can't beat these people if you're on this map. Um, and I think be able to say like, oh no, like oh they're in their sweet spot. They they're, they're playing Eden Ball now. This is the one they're gonna win. And I think that's that's like so cool to build kind of those legendary stories for sure. Yeah, for sure, man. Now let's let's switch it up here. How do you see NFTs and how do you see tokens within a game? What is your what are your thoughts on this? Because you're selling your NFTs for your heroes very very cheap for the people that don't know. Twenty dollars is actually insane. Nobody's done this before. And I love the fact that you're doing this. It yeah. gets upside potential for the people that want to flip. And also for the people that don't want to flip, that just want to really, really collect, collect for cheap. So I really like this idea. And then tell me a little bit more about yeah. your token and how do you see tokens in general in Play to Earn? Yeah, so we'll start with, with NFTs. Um, we're very, very adamant that NFTs are just for fun for us. Mm -hmm. um, there's no yield. There's no earning. There's no passive income. Um, that's cool. Like, trust me, like, again, I, I bought and sold the World of Warcraft accounts. The idea of making money playing games is really cool. Um, and we think you might make money playing our game. We call it play for fun. And then in tiny little font in parentheses, we have and sometimes earn. Uh, we, we don't we don't know if you're going to earn. That's that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is making sure you have fun. So for us, NFTs are really almost all cosmetic. They're all utility based. And so most of the NFTs in Eden Brawl, of course, there's no pay to win. You can't have a MOBA with purchasable items that make you stronger. Um, so NFTs are purely cosmetic. And so... The thing that was super, super, super important to us was if we're going to be the company that says, hey, we are the Web 2 to Web 3 bridge. We are the mass adoption game. We have to like live it in a way. Mm -hmm. We have to like truly say these are our optics and, and we really mean it. And step one was like, yeah, why would we sell NFTs for more than 20 bucks on, on this initial one? This is our these are our supporters. These are the people that want to play our game. These are the people that see our gameplay trailer and like, oh, my God, this is not a collectible item. This is a gameplay item. This is really cool. Um, and so honestly, the most important thing to communicate about our NFTs is they're never required. You can 100% play our game, play our ecosystem, and never, ever touch crypto, ever. And I think that was really, really important for us to knock out. Um, and then on the token front, it's honestly pretty similar. Um, there are pieces of our ecosystem that do run on tokens, but they're never really going to prohibit you from playing Eden Brawl. 
Um, it's just different economic elements that can get involved. And so my favorite way to explain this is just off-chain versus on-chain items. Um, this applies to most of the ecosystem. You're going to have to extrapolate a bit, but think rare skins versus legendary skins. There are going to be some skins that you can just pay $5 for, and they're off-chain, and it's just like any free-to-play game ever, and people are going to find a home there. Very, very familiar. And then there are legendary skins, and there's only 10,000 of those, and those are NFTs, and you're going to have to pay tokens to craft them, and you're going to be able to trade them. And yeah, sorry, free to put players like you may not get to to use those skins, but those people are also help. Those people are also helping you pay for everything else. Yeah, it doesn't affect you at all. It doesn't affect you um, at all. And yeah. I think that's that was really really important for us is to make sure we didn't necessarily have two segments of players. We had one segment of players, and those players could choose. And I think that's really the why we're doing the ecosystem model instead of just the single game model. I love the fact that you are very clear on that. Like yeah. you you know what you want. You know, because there's some other games that I talked to, I talked to so many games, and they're like in this in between, they don't really know, but no, you're like, literally, we're Web 2 with Web 3 elements. That's it. You know, we're a Web 2 game, you're going to come enjoy our game for free, and then on top of that, on the on the outside, now you can, you know, use your NFT skins and et cetera, et cetera, but it doesn't really affect your day-to-day -day in this game, right? Like, yeah, and we've, uh, we've had a lot of people come to us and like, I tell them like, hey, we're only selling our NFTs for 20 bucks. And they go, wait, why? And I'm like, you know how much revenue you're sacrificing for this? And I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of do. I know exactly how much revenue I'm sacrificing for this. But we think it's more important for like long-term sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get in the players that we know are going to play the game. We want to build the pillars right properly. And we think that's going to pay off for us mm -hmm. in, the, in the long term for sure. When can people play this? You know that people are going to start asking in the comments. And when can we play? Where can we download? Tell us a little bit more about where you're at as a game and when we can play this game. Yeah, so the best way to play it is to uh, join a guild, DAO, community, someone like Juice Team, honestly. Um, highly recommend Juice Team. Uh, if you're not already uh, signed up for, or, or integrated with them. But uh, we do show matches every now and then, and it's usually with communities like these. So that's usually the best way to play the game is put your name out there with one of those groups and, and hope you get selected. Um, we don't plan to open up to the public uh, super soon. Uh, we'll be doing a you know a few tests here and there just to get some, some early access and some, some feedback. But uh, honestly, we're going to be selling uh, early access passes early next year. Um, and that'll be really when we open it up. We're going to do a very slow roll launch um, because quality is super important to us. We don't want to release the game to the public. We only get one shot at releasing it. And we don't want to be that blockchain game where it's like, hey, no, 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 it'll be good in a year. Now we kind of want to drop it and have it be good. So, um, yeah, but about uh, April, May of next year is when we'll start seeing early access start to come out. Um, but we'll be dropping a lot of content over the next you know, six months until then. I like it. I think the foundation in uh in the next six months to one year, the foundation is gonna be a little bit stronger. Yep. I actually seen other games um, that are already built. I'm not gonna mention the names, and they're they're good, good games yep. that are built already. And they, I saw them complaining about why is our game not being played? Like nobody has delivered this type of level of game, you know, yep. this far. And it's like, yeah, you're right. You know, you you're maybe too early for for the <laughs> yeah the foundation still not here. We're getting there, right? Yep. So, so that's good. That's good that your game is going to be ready in one year, as a matter of fact. Yep. Now, let me ask you, will it ever be on mobile? And if not, are you planning to have mobile games in your world? Because mobile games, as you know, are probably the number one platform yeah. right now. And they will become <laughs> the platform, the go-to platform for probably most of the people in the world and they're just getting better yeah. and better and better. I totally agree. I think this is, this was a really, really big decision for us. Um, and I totally agree with you. I think mobile, like, you know, it's kind of like, if you want to make money, you probably should make a mobile game. <laughs> and if you want to hit as many people as possible, you should probably make a mobile game. Um, that said, what was really important to us was IP. And we think that like this idea of Sparkadia and this idea of an ecosystem to us, we had to lead with the PC game. It allows us by far the most flexibility um, and the most ability to deliver on some giant captivating IP. Um, that said, we do plan to do a mobile port for Eden Brawl eventually. Um, and then actually, prior to the bear market, we were actually working on two games at once. Um, hindsight 2020, whoops, maybe not the best idea. We probably grew a little too quick, but it was it was a bull market. We were all feeling really, really, really great about everything. Um, so our second game is what we call Saga right now, codename Saga, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's an idle RPG. So if you've ever seen like AFK Arena or Summoner's Era, it's those you know gotcha style mobile games. Um, and frankly, that's kind of a more pay to win game. And mm -hmm. everybody knows it. No one's mad about it. Um, it's just kind of the style of game. And so that's really the story of our ecosystem is we want to supplement 
you know, this pure traditional gameplay with games that kind of do lean more toward pay to win. And they, they really help complement each other. And I think what's super cool about that is it's the same heroes in Eden Brawl that it is in Saga. And so now all of a sudden you only have to buy one skin and you get to right. use it in both games. And I think that's what's really, really cool to us is how eventually all these spokes come in together and synergize. So uh, to answer the question directly, mobile port eventually, mobile game, probably before the mobile port. Um, and it'll all be accessible through like kind of this Arcadia hub. Nice. That, good strategy. Good strategy there. I, I agree with that strat. You know, you need a mobile strategy. Just like people yep. are saying to Web2 games, you need an NFT strategy. Well, if you are a company <laughs> in games, you need a mobile yep. strategy of some sort. Totally so, agree. Now, to end this off, when is the NFT skin sell? Um, tell us a little bit more details about it. Uh, yeah. Where is it going to drop, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah so uh, we... Our sale goes live on September 19th, uh, sometime in the morning. I think it's like uh, 10 or 11 Eastern time. Keep an eye out on our socials, obviously, for the exact time. Um, it will be launching on Rarible. So Rarible just started supporting Immutable. Um, so really excited to support that. They're doing a bunch of like launch trading reward type programs. Um, so you're kind of incentivized to, to do our stuff. So it's launching on Rarible on the 19th. Um, like we said, only 20 bucks. Uh, you're going to want to own a full set. Um, you can still get some of the bonuses without owning the full set, but you're, you're probably going to want to own a full set. Um, they actually aren't skins for us. They're what we call a collection. And uh, that's essentially like an asset class or an economic concept for us. And it's really simple. It's not required to play for the record. Um, but uh, as you own an entire collection, it's a, it's a set. It's a set of collectibles. And when you own the whole thing, they'll give you bonuses across the ecosystem. Namely, you earn tickets faster. So our in-game resource that you earn while playing is not tokens, it's not currencies, it's tickets. And so these tickets enter you into reward pools. So owning this will get you tickets faster. It's, it's kind of that simple. Um, so that's really our, our main utility on this. And uh, like I said, we're, we're trying to make it very, very accessible to get players of our games, um, not necessarily just speculators or investors. We, we invite you guys too. Uh, yeah, but what we're, what we're really, really, interested, yeah, what we're really interested in is, you know, I, I think the long term is going to be the players because these well, are I'm both. Are gonna, yeah, right. there you go. There you go. Yeah, I'm both. It. I'm literally always in the be in between. Like, okay, I love the skin, but damn, bro, I can flip it. What do I do? <laughs> right? Well, I kind think, of like. <laughs> I think you and I had talked about this before, and I think it's always so important to to talk about is when something gives you utility, you know, intrinsic value utility. I love this game, and this helps me have fun in this game, or this means a lot to me sentimentally. I love these characters, and I feel attached to it. Even if it's worth money, sometimes you're like, ooh, do I really want to sell this? And I always tell the story, like I used to sit on thousand dollar World of Warcraft accounts because I was like, well, I'm having fun. Like, why, why would I sell this? Like, I want to keep yeah, playing and it. I feel like I'll, a king I'll sell it later. Yeah, I'll, I'll sell it later. Um, so I think that's really what we're focusing on is getting those people who are like, uh, we kind of call it like play and grow. Like we want you to have so much portfolio with us, this utility portfolio that you don't want to sell it. So I think I think you're you're kind of our perfect fit for sure. Perfect, man. Look, uh, another day we will go into the story because I know story is a big thing yeah. in, in your world and I can see it. I can see that storyline is very important to get attached to these characters and all of this. Now, if you guys are watching this um, on YouTube right now, tomorrow, Saturday, tomorrow, Saturday, we have a space with Eden Brawl as well. And we're going to ask more questions there. It's going to be a little bit longer than this um, so make sure you drop by, make sure you follow uh, Sparkedia, make sure you follow Eden Brawl, make sure you follow me, make sure you follow the Juicy Major, just, just follow all of us, you know, <laughs> links in the description. If you see a follow button somewhere, click it. Uh, exactly. Now, Chandler, <laughs> any last words, you know, just anything that you have to say? You know? No, uh, it's been, I, I, nah. I don't, I don't want to, uh, to, to rehash it too much, but honestly, uh, Working with the Juice team so far has been super, super awesome. So, Kagi, thank you for having us on. Thank you for all the engagement you, you've had with us. Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of do my my classic shilling at the end here, uh, we're doing a big NFT giveaway before September 19th. Uh, literally, you get a ton of rewards, including off-chain rewards, potential on-chain rewards, a ton of stuff just for signing up. It's like put your wallet address in, join our Discord, do a couple other things, and you're, you're getting free stuff. Um, so there's no reason to sign it up. Every single person that signs up helps us out a lot because we love seeing that community grow. So please go sign up for that. Um, and stay tuned for a bunch more content before the 19th because we've got we've got partnership stuff lined up all week. Left so and right. Left and right. It's going to be a good time. All right, man. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. So anyways, guys, make sure you like, make sure you comment, make sure you subscribe to the number one NFT gaming channel.
in the world. It is number one. Peace. If you guys enjoy our content, make sure you guys follow us at the Juice Gaming Team on Twitter. And if you guys want to stay up to date with Web3 Gaming News, make sure you guys follow Juice Gaming News on Twitter. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next video.